Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Um, so we're now going to do the Q&A. And if all of our speakers um, have their video and microphones on, please, we're going to start with a question to Professor Birchall. Um, is there a connection between throat ligament and joint issues and sleep apnea and sleep breathing issues? Okay, so um, yeah, so, so I don't think the video is starting, but hopefully you can hear me now anyway. Um, yeah, and so I mean, sleep um, obstruction, obstructive sleep apnea can occur at multiple levels, um, and each of these levels can be affected by EDS. So um, most commonly, uh, it occurs at the palatal and tongue base levels. Um, we know that most people with EDS have high arch palates and actually probably slightly less prone to, to palatal level involvement, but certainly um, tongue base movement um, uh, can, can be increased. Uh, and the mobility there is certainly increased. And, and what I've seen is uh, floppiness around the arytenoid area. Um, sometimes you can actually get subluxation of those arytenoids that can slip in and out. Um, so I think, yeah, the, there is definitely a contribution at multiple levels um sleep problems in, in EDS yeah thank you and uh, now a question for uh Mr Wood um what exercises can we do to improve swallowing and vocal cord motion okay so we've got two parts there so you've got voice and swallowing and obviously as I said there's lots of muscles involved and it's difficult to give if you like a panacea um, I think obviously we have to be symptom based in the way in which we treat. Um, there are some general exercises that people can do um, for their voices, voice warm ups, um, such as there are, as I said, semi occluded vocal tract exercises, which you can see on YouTube. But I think the difficulty with hypermobility is that um, I know a lot of people would say that singers can be vocal athletes. I know Rodney Game has said about you know, a lot of professional singers may have some degree of hypermobility. And the problem is, is overextending. So I would always encourage people to do voice warm-ups, and there are lots of apps out there that people can do if they have difficulty um, with singing and they want to improve singing. But it's whether you want to improve your vocal quality or whether you want to improve your vocal athleticism. Um, so I'd always say to people, obviously you have to be symptom-based in the way in which you're going to approach your exercises. Um, but there are lots of apps out there and there's no harm in doing voice warm-ups, genuine voice warm-ups for most people. If it feels painful, if it feels effortful, I think that's what you need to be looking at. If you're doing something that feels wrong, stop. Um, regarding the swallowing, I think is a very diff different thing because it depends on the aspect of swallowing and what difficulties you're having. So there are some aspects where you could say if you're having difficulties with swallowing um, solids over liquids, as I said in my talk, just chopping things up might be um, better. If you have difficulties with the oral um, proprietary side of things, um, again, chopping it up might be beneficial. Some people would talk about having liquids to swallow things down. Um, but as we said before, with tablets, that can be difficult because tablets will move slower than liquids. So what you would do is put it into some yogurt. Um, so there, you have to be symptom based in the way in which you would be doing exercises. So I think panaceas are very difficult and I think certainly seeking people, seeking a speech therapist who specialises in EDS or just swallowing will probably be the way to go. Um, but certainly voice warm ups have no problem. Um, if it feels painful, I think you just need to think about it. if it's painful, if it's um, uncomfortable, you must stop. Great, thank you. And uh, Dr. Kapfira Seebacher, um, uh, are cavities more common in types of EDS and HSD? No, um, cavities are not more common. There are some rare types of EDS, like atrocholastic EDS or dermatosporaxis EDS, which are associated with an inherited inherited the defect of the enamel or the dentine, but we don't have these problems with hypermobile EDS. So to the best of my knowledge, because we don't have data on this, but the patients I have with hypermobile EDS, 
they don't have more problems with cavities or caries than other patients have. Thank you. And back to Professor Virtual. Regarding hearing loss, is there any evidence that the small bones in the inner ear move more in EDS patients, causing intermittent worsening of hearing loss? Gosh, what an excellent question. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I will rush out on Monday and, and we will look at this. That's, that's a brilliant question. Um, no, there is no evidence, um, but it does kind of stand to reason. I mean, it is actually the tiniest joint in the body um and there are definitely ways that one can measure that audiometrically um we've not really seen a lot of hearing loss that we could really pin down to um eds and i, I think a lot of the reason for that is that the the auditory pathway has a lot of what we call redundancy there's a lot of um spare bits to it so if one part goes the others can pick up be, be, be that in the brain part or in the microphone part called the cochlea or in, in the peripheral part, the amplifier, the little bones. So, you know, actually we see relatively little. What we do see, of course, is um, tinnitus and dizziness um, when there are elements of brainstem involvement, um, you know, if that's being squeezed a little bit by the top of the spine. But uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I think we should look at that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and a question for Mr. Wood. Um, how prevalent is uh, TMJ and EDS and what are the best ways you find to manage the chronic pain and subluxations? I've certainly seen patients with TMJ issues. Um, I don't think there's any evidence or studies that I've seen that, sh that say that it is more prevalent in EDS but certainly I've seen patients with it um, and um, I think you know, it's an area of, again another research area that needs to happen. Um, it is a big joint. Um, it's a very common, actually people get very tight there. Um, and um, I also get patients who have dislocated. So it can be back to this, sometimes it's too lax, sometimes it's too tight. Any muscular show around here, um, you're gonna get this compensation effect of too loose or too tight. And so getting tension in the jaw is gonna cause restriction um, for chewing. Um, also overextending, I've had one patient where they had actually had jaw surgery because they had the malocclusion um, and it was misdiagnosed but actually they need she actually had hypermobility of the joint and so actually totally wrecked all of her um, chewing mechanism because they actually went in and did surgery incorrectly um, so I think yes it is prevalent I don't think there's any evidence to show how prevalent sorry I can't hear sorry. did professor Birchall want to comment on that I think he had a hand up. And, and oh yeah, no, I, I, I was just going to say um, that, uh, yeah, I agree with everything that Gary said. Um, I think, although it may not be more prevalent, it can be more problematic, I think it was safe to say. Um, and as with all other aspects of EDS, avoiding surgery is, is probably a good idea wherever possible. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the TMJ is a combination of issues. It's, it's certainly structural around the joint, but it's, a, it's mostly to do with the muscles as well. So you have to address all of the issues that might be contributing to the pain and altered, altered movement. And that, and that includes um, exercises, jaw splints, um, sometimes intervening with, with muscle relaxants where appropriate, um, and dealing with any um, super added stress psychological issues where that's feasible. Uh, it all interacts around the TMJ. Thank you. And uh, Ines, did you want to add something as well? Yes, I want to comment on the prevalence of TMJ problems. Um, there are seven studies out there um, and 200 patients with EDS were uh, investigated in these studies and 100% had problems with the TMJ. So this was chronic pain in half of them or sounds of the joint like clicking or popping in 80%. So I think TMJ problems are very prevalent in EDS patients. Thank you. And one more question whilst we're with you. Um, are receding gums common and what is the best course of treatment for them in EDS? Uh, receding gums are uh, very common in periodontal EDS. They should not be more prevalent in the other EDS types uh, than in the general population. 
um, for receiving gums, you don't have to treat them because there are not a pathology. But if uh, from an aesthetic point of view, you want to treat them or if you have hypersensibility of the roots, then you can treat them and you always have to do a surgery. A gum surgery, this is not a big surgery. You just need a local anesthetic and then you do it. Uh, and it takes one hour to cover the uh, receding gums. But there is no other therapy than surgery. Thank you. And that's all we have time for. We have had hundreds of questions for you all. So we will follow up with our helpline. And um, this is such a kind of under-researched area, as you said, that so many people have issues with. So thank you all for your time today and for your talks. It's been really, really educational and beneficial. So now we are on 10 minute break. We're really sorry for the quick turnaround times on breaks today, but we have so much good content for you all to hear. So we're packing it in. But the good thing about virtual conferences is you can be sitting here eating, snacking away and no one knows. So have a wriggle, have a snack, and we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Thanks everyone. <laughs>